Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, so we've got uh, uh, quite a full agenda for you today. I'm going to uh, uh, rattle through things quite quickly so we can get to the bits that I think we're, we're all most interested in, the demonstration and the panel discussion. Um, but we're going to start with some intros, and then we're conscious that we've got different levels of experience across the audience uh, for intelligent automation. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes level sitting, trying to get to a common set of a, a level of understanding there. Um, then we'll talk through a few real world problems, pulling out the challenges, the solutions that were delivered and the benefits that were realized. And, and then uh, art of the possible demos. We're going to show you some integrated tools and show you how easy this is to, to uh, how easy it is to get these working with the systems you have today. Um, then we have a panel discussion where we hopefully we've brought some thought provoking topics for you and we're going to move into Q&A. On the call with me today, I've got uh, Karen, who's facilitating, who's spoken to you already, myself, who's uh, presenting uh, uh, the level setting up front, Marco, who run the demonstration, and we've got T Chris Dudridge and Patrick Hosh joining us for the panel discussion. So a quick introduction to T-Impact. Um, we are digital transformation specialists. We work with partners such as uh, AWS, Sirocco, and we build bots who join us on the call today. Um, also with, with companies such uh, uh, RPA vendors such as UiPath. Um, we have 15, uh, in excess of 15 years transforming operation for some of the biggest companies in the world, such as at, at, at HSBC, uh, where we rolled out solutions across uh, six of their countries, and the NHS, which is the third largest employer in the world. Uh, our real flagship project is with NHS Blood and Transplant, where we built the organ donation and transplantation solution. Um, so this is a, a, a life and death critical 24-7, 365 days a year solution um, that was in a very highly regulated industry um, that determines who gets organs when an organ becomes available. So as you can imagine, the matching to select the right person to get that organ is under a lot of scrutiny. Um, we're, we're proud of all of our customer sites uh, 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 solutions, but particularly this one where the benefits measured in the number of lives that we save each quarter. Um, what we do as an organization, we improve customer journeys, you might say patient pathways if you're in healthcare, with process mining and Lean Six Sigma techniques. We automate customer workflows with chatbots, RPA, AI, and workflow. And then we confirm benefits with benefit dashboards. Oh, I should mention that we also have uh, six local government customers and a number of NHS. So just to scene set as far as uh, uh, intelligent automation, um, so there is a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, mystique about this. And what we really want to do is bring this down to earth, make it use very plain speak uh, 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 to, to, to help you relate to this. Um, so the challenge that we set out when we're working with customers and, you, and harnessing the power of these intelligent automation tools is to help them realign their organization and their operating model to provide consistent and uh, uh, experience across multiple channels, be they digital, phone, face-to-face, -face, post, remove waste and defects from their business processes and align their IT system with their business processes. We also want to help them provide a, we want to, uh, the reason for doing this is to try and ensure that they can provide a better service to their customers, reducing complexity and cost. Um, and, but the challenge is always that the staff you need to run some of these projects are spending too much time on low value work. So a big focus for us is how do you free those people from that low value work to, to participate in these programs because they're the ones that really have the understanding of the way your business runs or your organization runs. <clears throat> so we thought we would start off by uh, helping you to understand the, the, the suite of tools involved in intelligent automation and how they fit together in a standard design pattern that could be applied for any number of business challenges. If we start with the kind of the 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 the, the uh, <laughs> beginning and end, the brackets, process mining or is a tool that really helps you to quantify the potential for both process improving improvement and automation. So you can use these tools to uh, get deep insight into what your teams perform today, um, and to understand how that complies. And, or, or varies from a standard process that you think might be implemented across your organization. 
on the on the on the back end uh, benefits reporting dashboards help you to measure the tangible benefits you know the very easy thing to, to measure is labor savings but we also want to think about cost avoidance we want to think about new revenue opportunities including in low uh, uh, public sector where there's quite often opportunities for those it also gives you some of the metrics to help you support less tangible such as improved customer service so if you don't have any metrics for putting a monetary value on net promoter score, it can give you some in indicative metrics that, that, that help you with that. Uh, and finally, it gives you insight into continuous improvement and opportunities from the processes once they've been automated. In between, when we think about chatbots, robots, and AI, any one of these uh, tools can add value in and of itself, but when combined, it, they're, they're incredibly powerful. Chatbots can speak to your customers to help them to understand, <clears throat> to deal with common questions and help identify what services they might want to fulfill. It can do that in multiple languages across multiple channels, voice, chat, social media. And there can be a seamless handover back and forth between the chatbot and live agents to make sure that if there's nuances or complex services that they're delivered. Chatbots can then trigger fulfillment with a robot which can go in and fulfill the services, performing the work normally performed by your, by your staff. Um, it can access your IT systems without any integration, without any changes to your system, and it can produce the continuous improvement insight that is accessible via the uh, benefits reporting dashboard. And finally, artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence in and of itself is very powerful, but how do you actually influence the behavior of your staff or deliver value to your customers with it uh, without integrating into all of your IT systems? The easiest way is via the robots, where the requests are sent by the robots to AI, either to unpick some unstructured data, such as a photograph, an image, handwriting, or to read through some text and, and determine what the intention is, or to uh, perform some his, uh, uh, to, to make decisions based on historical patterns, recommending best action uh, or decisions based on data patterns. So when you see the three of these combined, you really get so much more value than you do with any single one. But to identify where you would actually uh, want, sorry, but to identify the best place to actually implement these intelligent automation tools, process mining really helps you very quickly prioritize the activities and quantify the benefits. <clears throat> so just to uh, add a little meat to the bone, if you look at the at the at your typical organization, you'll have digital customer interface and a t traditional customer interface with your customers come in via your website or your call center or your office, and then no matter which way they come in, the activity gets handed over to some uh, staff who have to go and fulfill it. Whether these staff are dealing with social care request, housing, revenue benefits, uh, 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 direct debit exceptions. What, what have you. Uh, you, you have staff that are basically gluing together a broken process with a, solo, a series of uh, solo IT systems that don't quite align. Um, if we add to that intelligent automation, your chatbot can uh, ha engage your customers. And so it, it doesn't have to be exclusive. It can be just another channel that they're offered. The chatbot can pass activities through to your staff to fulfill as they have before, or it can pass it directly to a robot. And the robot can access artificial intelligence to interpret unstructured data or make decisions. So you can layer this right over top of your existing IT systems with virtually no change whatsoever. When you think about identifying the potential for these, I just really want to drill this home. So if we think about that's the operating model uh, uh, that we're moving toward in a digital transformation where we can get uh, the benefits of intelligent automation, actually identifying those opportunities um, with process mining allows us to uh, really to map out the process, as you can see in the, the diagram in the lower right there. So it starts to monitor what your staff are doing and reverse that into and capture that and produce a process map, capture the time that they actually spend on that. And from that, they can start to produce the benefits. How many hours of labor? What other benefits could actually be saved? And that's both for, as we said earlier, improving and automating the process. On the flip side, once you've got the solution in place, you've identified what to build, you've deployed, 
um, and this deployment can be quite quick, you can start to get the measurements. Uh, so there's a couple of screen prints from our benefit dashboard here. There's uh, others available in the market where you can get a view across the processes that are running, what benefits that you are accruing on a hour by hour, day by day, month by month, basically any date range you want. And you can drill into each one of those to understand for that specific process, which use case or scenarios generating the benefits, what exceptions are occurring out of it, and start to get some insight into what could you change about that running a, a, a solution to enable it to process more transactions and deliver more benefits. Um, one of the things that we're often asked is, um, we have a real challenge, you know, particularly when we speak to our local government and NHS uh, customers with multicultural communities, quite often communities that don't speak English, and, and customers that have come to expect a certain level of service based on, on their experience with Amazon and other, you know, advanced digital websites. Um, and, it, and it's really quite straightforward. You have an opportunity to layer over your systems with very little change to your systems whatsoever. You can start to uh, and without hiring more staff or staff with special language skills, you can start to speak to customers in their preferred language via your chatbot channel. And again, this can be via social media, web chat, or voice. You can provide those services when and where the customers want to access those services. Um, so you can move uh, to 24 hours or, or up close to 24 hours as long as your IT systems are available. And you can, uh, the robots can continue, can do the fulfillment work so that you don't need to have staff on, on hand in multiple shifts to support those extended hours. When we look at the uh, benefits, the key five key benefits we tend to focus on and we see delivered time and again is uh, first and foremost, an improvement to customer service, personalization, the extended hours, the customer driven services, starting to come up with new ways of delivering services and starting to predict what it is your customer would want and, and maybe to supply that before it's, before it's requested. Savings, um, by reducing operating costs, you can all continue to offer more of your services and protect them. You can improve quality by eliminating waste and failure demand, uh, which is uh, uh, services that are requested because they weren't delivered correctly the first time. You can also centralize common tasks uh, across different service lines. Real-time service where, you know, rather than submitting something by paper or, or, or by a PDF document, waiting two or three days for, for the, for the uh, service to be delivered and then get a, a, a letter, an email through uh, in, in the, uh, sometime later, um, we can move more toward digital by default. Uh, IDC predicts that 24% of all uh, government services will be real-time by 2023. Increasing intelligence, we hear, hear this quite a lot. Um, we're, we're all drowning in information, but how do you do something with it? Uh, part of the challenge is that the data that's going into our systems very often has errors in it or is inconsistent or it's updated in one system and not another. So there's an opportunity to cleanse the data across your systems and to leverage insight to improve the services and increase revenue. And then finally, create capacity. <clears throat> We're all, uh, every, all organizations are stretched at the, at the moment. There's increasing demand for, for labor, particularly since the changes that we've had here in the UK with, with Brexit and immigration. So uh, there's going to be more and more competition for the, for the staff that you need to deliver service. So how will you continue to uh, fill the, the openings that come in your organization while also delivering these transformation programs? What well, you need to invest now to start freeing staff up so that they can start to, to uh, 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 define the solutions for you and, and uh, get more work automated so it doesn't require so many staff. So that was our whistle stop tour of intelligent automation. I wanted to run through a few real life examples with you to try and bring that to life. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through our tree diagram here, but it gives you an idea of, the, of some of the types of projects we've delivered across different organizations and different departments within organizations. <clears throat> the ones in reds are, are ones that are actively under work at the moment. But the thing I wanted to emphasize, these intelligent automation projects, they're fast. They usually delivered in four to eight weeks and, they, and with our approach, they're very low disruption. So we require minimal capacity from your staff. Uh, so it doesn't take your staff away from the front line. It doesn't take your IT staff away from the tasks that they have already for days at a time. It's a few hours here and a few hours there. Um, and, and quite often it's uh, delivered in, in for, accept, 
for you to uh, accept in four to eight weeks. Looking at some specific examples, um, this is a, a project we ran for a London council. Um, they had uh, some great success with direct debit. They were already getting thousands of direct, uh, 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 thousands of their customers signing up for direct debit. The problem was they also had thousands of exceptions being produced. Um, one of the big challenges they had was that the customer would sign up for direct debit using a, a name that was slightly presented in a slightly different way than it was in the revenue and bin system. In this case, it was Academy. Um, so might use Academy has a forename and surname. Uh, the person signed up for direct debit may put in five names or may put in a different uh, uh, name into, into those fields because they don't typically present it that way. So we built a solution that actually addressed that, eliminated, uh, eliminated uh, duplicates and improved the matching. The first iteration of this solution, we got about 73% of the exceptions would be processed, um, uh, but we didn't think that was good enough. We went back, we worked together with our customer, we analyzed the data, we understood why some of the ex uh, exceptions couldn't be matched up by the intelligent automation solution. And we increased that to um, mid 80s, I think it was 85, 86%. Um, and then uh, in the next iteration, we increased it up to over 90%. So it was, it, we like this one because it's a good example of a project that ran over a period of time. We got more insight out of it. and We could continue improving it. Um, this is a project that uh, rent increases is a challenge that uh, many councils face in that uh, they provide social housing, but the organization that supply the social housing want to increase the price. Um, and they have rules about when that can be done, how much it can be increased by, and certain checks that have to be performed. <clears throat> when this is done only annually, obviously there will be a huge burst of work when these uh, re re increased requests come in and they have to be processed. Um, in some councils, they were having to bring in agency staff, they were having to, to uh, redeploy staff from other jobs to deal with these requests, um, which was leading to high cost because of the agency staff cost, but also stress and backlogs in, in other departments as staff were taken away from their day job to, to, to deal with these peaks. So our solution, we put in a solution that automated uh, uh, the, the rental increase. It would uh, apply the same business rules, but it would do it 100% consistently. Um, the way the solution worked is that uh, the council required uh, the landlords to submit the request in a, in a standard uh, Excel format. So the, the, the uh, landlords would submit that. Unfortunately, sometimes it, they would password protect it and forget to send the password or put the password in the covering email or in another email that they send the next day or the next week. But we built the solution to deal with all of that so it, it could uh, uh, extract the Excel, search for the, for the password and apply the password. And if it wasn't sent within a time, it would send back to the customer. The solution also sent out a confirmation letter to let the, that the landlord know the decision. Um, in this one, we automated, uh, or were able to automate 10,000 rental increases per month. Um, we uh, eliminated the need to hire a temp staff in, and this project paid for itself uh, within, the, within the, the first annual run of increases. So there's a very good return on investment. Um, the third example we thought we'd bring to life for you was in a different area. It's environment protection. Um, they go out on client site. Quite often, they have to take pictures as evidence of uh, some of their findings. Um, so they also had loads of, uh, of notifications coming through from automated uh, IT systems, and um, they'd come up with quite a clever solution for sending back these uh, uh, these photos back to the, the head office. A kind of quasi mobility solution. They would just use their mobile phone to take a picture, attach it to an email, send it back. But that left a very low value and tedious job to extract all of these photos, extract the content of these automated emails, and upload it into uh, their workflow system. They used information at work in, in, in this case. And, and every time it was uploaded, it had to be indexed so that they could find it. So it had to be categorized appropriately and to the appropriate account. So we built a, a, a solution that did exactly that. Um, it not only uh, eliminated the need for that, uh, 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 that tedious work in the back office, it eliminated an open position that they'd been unable to fill for a number of years. I think it had been close to five years they'd been trying to get up to a full complement. 
And because they weren't full, uh, they didn't have a full team, they'd had to cut back on uh, important but less urgent activities, such as offering chargeable services, tra training, pest control, et cetera, services that they, they'd offered out to customers. So they were able to bring in that, that revenue again. So there was a good example of generating revenue uh, in, in, a, in a public sector, eliminate a staff hire, <clears throat> and free uh, one, one of their existing staff for, for much more interesting work. So hopefully we, we all now have a general idea of what intelligent automation is and, and a good idea of how it could be applied in some real life business cases. We wanted to uh, now bring it to life with a, with a demo. Sorry, Keith, I'm just gonna stop you there. We're, get, we're gonna have a slight change in agenda and we're gonna put the demo towards the end. Day. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry to uh, throw that one at you. So, uh, 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 <laughs> so uh, can we move on to the uh, panelists, uh, the panel questions? Of course, of course. Never work with uh, children, animals, or live demos. That's a yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. So, Karen, I'll hand over to you to the panel demo, uh, panel discussion. You let me know when we're ready with the demo. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So our first question we have for the panel today is um, we'll start with what advice would you give on how to convince decision makers to take a more holistic approach to transformation efforts and not just focus on technology? Um, uh, Chris from Sirocco, if you can uh, take this one first, please. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for that. Um, it's a pretty broad question, I think, ultimately. Um, and, and some of the stuff that, that, that Keith was talking about at the outset of this call is really important to factor. Um, and, and the first thing is why, you know, why are businesses looking to transform um, and, and why are they looking to, to, to their processes and the way in which they work? And it's the first time I've ever heard it, Keith say, say this out loud, and I've worked with him for, for, for many years. Um, but I absolutely love the ROI that is based on lives saved um, in, in the example that you gave there. You know, that's a great example of why an organization may set out to, to transform their business in a very holistic way for an amazing end goal. Um, but typically organizations, you know, start that journey with one of, I believe, kind of four uh, benefits in mind. And that's to transform employee um, satisfaction. That's to transform customer satisfaction. That's to ultimately accelerate the transformation of their business and their future state business using digital transformation. And ultimately a critical one is to kind of reduce risk and increase compliance. Um, and, you know, I think there's another one that, that sort of came out in, in what, what uh, Keith was talking about, which is now a new drive to create capacity and to ensure that, you know, with a lot of factors affecting the way in which we undertake our work to deliver the services to our customers, to ultimately deliver the, the aforementioned benefits, we really have to think about what we're trying to achieve. So that's the why. Um, you know, but when we when we think about this, and of course we have a, a vested interest in in, in taking a, a more holistic approach to, to transformation, we're helping organizations start by actually understanding what is happening on the ground. What is what their users are actually doing to, to get to the end goal of delivering that piece of work, you know, saving a life, uh, you know, uh, pr posting that invoice or essentially receiving cash, you know, whichever those, those end goals may be. And so the question is, how do we get to the level of detail to help um, you know, business leaders to make the decisions on where the biggest impact will come from? And I believe, and, and we believe at Sirocco, that that's from really understanding how their employees are working, actually working today. Um, you know, we, we're a task mining vendor. So our, our focus is on understanding by using you know, desktop agents that capture the user interactions with every system, not just systems that provide uh, user logs, to actually paint a picture, a telescopic view of the organization in, in, in how people are working today. But we typically don't do that in a, in a big bang approach, we typically work with customers who have an end goal in sight when they're starting that journey. And so, you know, what, what we believe is important is that they build that picture from the ground up first and foremost and fundamentally, so that they can then use technologies such as ours and other, other tools that, that, that Keith has very well articulated before to understand where they're gonna get the biggest bang for buck, how they are going to deliver against the, the benefits they're setting out before. Um, and with the map that you can provide based on the current mode of operation and with the ability to then understand exactly which of those 
processes or or even bigger end-to-end -end processes that, that 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 link to multiple processes um can be stitched together um we then see there being huge value in in, in leveraging that to power um journeys towards technologies such as rpa for quick tactical automation wins for other technologies that, that sit in corporate business transformation programs, including the use of their ERP, CRM technologies and other such. Um, and so for us, we think it's really important that, that they're not just looking at tactical uh, opportunity in terms of transformation. We're, we're hoping that they can use technology and common sense to go through and really help paint a picture of where they can help um, their entire organization focus on the biggest and most lucrative opportunities. Kim, could I just add to that? <clears throat> uh, great, great uh, answer, Chris. Very, very, very articulate. Thank you. The in, in, in addition, looking at it from uh, integrators point of view, um, there have been times when we've been working with customers who've decided to replace one or more of their IT systems um, and asked us for support with that. And when we asked them, uh, how did they select their system? You know, what, what did they, they base it upon? They, you know, pull out a list of requirements. And when we ask them, well, how do you know these requirements are complete? How do you know they're actually going to meet the needs of your business? And, and they have nothing to refer back to. And the only true source you can refer back to is a operating model supported by, by uh, the business processes that are, that are actually running. So if you're investing in looking to invest in technology and you've got a wish list from a series of business users, it may or may not achieve the outcome you actually want. If you haven't based that against what your team is actually doing today and what specifically you want to change about the day-to-day -day activities they're, they're performing, then, then it's at it, it best a wish list. So just coming from a slightly different angle there. Thank you, yeah. Keith. Chris, did you want to add anything else? Sorry. No, I, I, I thought that was an interesting perspective. And, and yeah, naturally, there's also a reverse engineering of that because, you know, um, Keith flashed up a number of business, you know, applications that you know, certain organizations use. Some of these have been in operation for, for an, you know, an exceptionally long time. And so often their intended use and the configuration of these tools doesn't necessarily lend it to the way in which the business will be working in today and tomorrow. And ultimately remembering it's got to service the employees and the customers to, 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 to deliver value. Uh, and so often there has to be an analysis of whether the tools that you're using to do the job ultimately are still fit for purpose. And sometimes that's a really, really hard exercise to undertake because as Keith, as you referred to, if you look back against the standard operating procedures and, and the usage of those systems, you know, in, in order to know that you can ultimately transform those for the future state of your business, you really need to take a look at how that is being done today. Um, and this is where it becomes quite interesting in the kind of task and process mining arena, because these tools can be used to actually map end user interactions, not only with processes, but also, you know, enterprise applications. Um, and that is also a critical factor to, to ensuring that when you transform either using tools such as RPA, automation, sentiment analysis, everything that you could imagine employing to, to improve the way you, you, you deliver your work, you know, having that ground up built picture of how your users are actually interacting with those systems is a critical factor as well. Um, and it's something that many of the task and process mining vendors, ourselves included, can help paint a picture of. Great, thank you very much, Chris and, and Keith on that one. Uh, the, next, the next question we have for the panel is, um, how is digital technology improving customer experience? And, and Patrick from We Build Bots, I'd like you to, uh, can you take that one? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, customer experience is kind of our, our arena where we're playing with, with our conversation AI platform. And I think the, the, the really the key how the technology is going to help customer experience is all about accessibility. I think these days it's, it's extremely important to make your services, especially on those services, accessible and bring it to the customer. When I say bring it to the customer, it's about bringing it to where the customer wants it to be and how they want it to be. It's not about us making assumptions and, and kind of forcing a customer into a certain channel and stuff. And what it basically means is you got to bring 
let's say um, a huge demographic for one of our customers is is in sort of the 20 to 25 year old bracket. So bringing the experience to the technology that they use, which in most cases is something like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, is extremely important. They don't want to deal with picking up a phone. They want to text someone. Um, so you got to make sure that you address the accessibility needs of that of the key demographic that you want to work with. But that's that's not the only thing. It also, and I think there's a good point that Keith raised earlier about dealing with multicultural um, communities, especially in local authority space, making your services accessible in a way that they understand. And and I mean, I include myself in that. I'm, I'm originally from Austria, so I speak German and and. I think it's it, it's a lot harder for, for other people to come to a country and maybe not speak the language to the degree that you need um, to deal with essential services that the government provides and, and making sure that those services are then available to those people through automated translations, through digital technology that can cater for conversations in your native language without a, a big fuss in the background is extremely important. Um, so someone from, I don't know, myself coming from Austria I could have a conversation with a council in German because they might not be happy to talk in English for whatever reason, but getting the same service level as someone who has spoken English all their life and is, is completely fluent is, is a key priority, I think. And then the third part of that in, in terms of accessibility and, and how digital technology can improve customer experience is also making it accessible not just from a cultural and language perspective or channel perspective, but also um, from, from a, a perspective where, for example, if you're vision impaired, you might want to access the same service and get the same service level through, uh, let's say, a voice spot, for example. Um, if you're hearing impaired, you might want to go through a chatbot, for example, rather than voice. So I think these, these are the key points these days where digital technology can really help improve the customer experience, making it accessible to everyone, no matter what your background is, what the, your preference in technology is. Patrick, maybe I could just, uh, sorry, I don't want to comment on each one of these, but just add to what you say there. I, I think there's some really good points around, around you know, language availability and, and, and via the channels people like. There's also being able to do things that uh, lots of organizations have dreamed of doing for years, but have been held back by their current systems. I know in Lithuania in particular, uh, have really pushed forward with uh, their customer journeys. For example, when someone moves into a certain region, their children, they're, they're sent a welcome pack. When, they, when a child is born, they're automatically uh, 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 enrolled in, into the school in the area when they come, when they come of age. So they, they, their local councils, in, or whatever the name of local councils in Lithuania, are much more proactive in offering services to their customers. And that's because they've, they've built more capability on top of the, the old IT legacies that they have today. So I think, uh, it, it, in, in addition to all the good points that you you raise, it re there really is an opportunity to throw the shackles off and think what is good service to our customers. Design what you want and have it built without having to spend millions and millions of pounds replacing these older IT systems that have all your data locked in them. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think that the one thing I would add to that is also exploring. Uh, different partnerships between companies, organizations, and local authorities to really, like you say, make it a seamless experience. I mean, I've been through it uh, about seven, eight months ago, now moving within the UK. But if you go on a chatbot to change your council tax, for example, through partnerships, this could be a much more uh, inclusive experience and proactive experience for a customer to say, okay, you've just moved, you've, you've done your council tax changes. Have you actually thought about electricity? Have you thought about water and connecting all these services and making sure that again they're accessible through one consistent channel makes it a lot more practical, a lot easier for the customer. Okay, thank you very much. And the, and the final question in the panel discussion is um, is for both uh, Chris and Patrick. So um, Chris, if you want to pick this one up first, what are the key challenges you see for personalising customer service and providing joined up customer engagement? Chris? Yeah, I mean, 
when it comes to you know customer service, you know, if, and, uh, irrespective of whether this is public sector or, or private sector, um, I think you know Patrick pretty much alluded to it in his previous sentiment. It, it has to be something that understand understands and puts the user journey first. You know, with my experience of kind of deploying RPA as a good example in my former life um, into a contact center arena or into a into you know um, chatbots as a good example. Um, you know, this is the first entry point that a customer will will typically have with your organisation. Uh, typically in the kind of B two C arena, in my example here. And so, you know, if, if that is a transactional, um, ill thought out service that you're providing to the customer, it's going to do exactly the same as, as 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 you know as you'd expect in terms of a poor customer experience. So. You know, when thinking out the journeys that you're going to take customers on, and that's the key word, customers on, you know, you're going to have to really map out the the expectations of what is going to deliver an exceptional customer service. What services you can provide that are you know, personalized and, and, and not fallible so that they become actually a poor service. And really think about mapping those user journeys in a way that is going to enhance the services you offer to the customers. Um, I, I would go so far as to say, if these are ill thought out and the underlying back office processes or the underlying you know, um, actions that, that take place from the personalization processes you implement are poorly delivered, you'll lose customers. You'll lose customer trust, you'll lose customer faith. And, and, in, and in this current market, even looking at some of the you know the challenges we have in the energy sector at the moment um you know with with kind of engaging maintaining and supporting customers um you know poor customer experience and poor customer service just is not tolerated thank you chris uh patrick hey sounds it pretty much up what chris said <laughs> uh no it's brilliant um uh, I think the, the key challenge is uh, pretty much as, as Chris said is, is really focusing on on the journey, and that's that's where a lot of projects kind of fall on the, the face at the very beginning, not involving the customer and, and possibly even a customer cohort to define the journey and making sure that the customer um, has their input in in some shape or form, um, and that that doesn't necessarily mean you have to get people come in and, and sit with you. you you have like any cost uh, sorry any any organization has a ton of data around the customers how they behave how they work and it's making the most out of it and i think the other key challenge that, that we see is taking the processes that um, traditionally happened manually and and thinking i'll take that and just put it into technology and i've solved my customer service problems that's that's absolutely not how it works. It's when you go on these transformation journeys and, and uh, revisit your customer service um, and custom engagement platforms and, and the way you engage with people. That is the prime opportunity to kind of stop right there, um, take stock, see what works, what didn't work, and does it actually work in a new world? And when I say new world, it's it's combining technology um, and different platforms with each other. And in most cases, it doesn't. So you, it's not just taking a process and moving it from A to B. It's taking the process and essentially throwing it out the window to, to a large degree and, and refactoring it into what you actually want to achieve. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we're we're going to move on to um, Q&A now. Um, we're still working on trying to get that that demo ready for you. We we we, we promise we will get you something. Um, so the first first question we have that's come through, we've got a few questions here. First question we have that's come through for um, for Keith. Um, how do you identify the processes that could be improved with digital technologies? <clears throat> well, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, one, you could set out to do it manually. Um, you could run structured workshops where you uh, identify and prioritize the processes you want to look at. And then once you prioritize, you do a shallow dive to understand the key activities and you start to work out from that uh, what the potential benefits of the change would be and what the potential costs so you can get a return on investment before you start engaging in an implementation project. But a much more uh, intelligent and, and quicker way of doing it is to use uh, 
uh, uh, process analysis tools, process mining tools, such as Chris has been uh, referring to in, in, in the in the panel discussion, where you can actually install this on the clients, uh, on, on the machines of the staff who were executing the process, performing the process, I should say, and the process is actually mapped out from the work they're doing. The savings and the benefits are generated or potential savings is is uh, uh, generated from that, and then based on the strategic value that is going to deliver to you as an organization, plus the benefits, minus the cost, the complexity, and consideration of the change appetite, you can then prioritize and start to put together a program plan of which project should should run and in which order. Chris, I imagine you might have a bit more to say about that. No shock there. Um, yeah, I, I think I think you know ultimately I think you captured it really well. There's many ways to do it, you know, Keith, and and you know we don't want to be too precious about saying there's not value in in kind of ideating and debating, you know, how to transform processes, in in you know in a structured fashion, you know, using discussions as humans. However, you know the the, the demand for identifying kind of uh, transformation opportunity fast. Um, is pressing on many organizations, which is why this category is growing really fast. Um, and it's important to know that there's kind of many ways to skin this challenge. Uh, you know, obviously process mining at, at, at the top level is a, is a really powerful tool for analyzing inefficiency uh, within systems that produce logs um, and actually painting pictures of where the business and enterprise business applications you're using can be transformed for better outcomes. However, with, with Sirocco, um, what we've delivered is a, is a technology which requires, you know, zero IT integration, you know, very, very little end user and SME input other than teaching, you know, uh, standard processes and happy paths to ensure we can match um, those, um, those uh, processes in the wild. And what we're able to do at a very large scale in a very quick manner is paint the picture about where organizations have the biggest opportunity for effort reduction, not only just by um, uh, automation, which is, of course, a key lever that many organizations want to pull on, but also through things that many other products in the marketplace uh, miss, which is, you know, critical factors such as process transformation, you know, user training, system standardization and templatization. Um, and so for us, you know, uh, organizations can really leverage the power of a technology tool set uh, that helps them get to that end goal quicker. Um, but it still requires the, the thought analysis and input from the people who are ultimately responsible for delivering those processes to understand which becomes the biggest priority for their organization. Um, Chris, I don't think I've shared this with you before, but we did some analysis recently with, uh, in, in fact, with one of your team, uh, looking at uh, the work that we do for business process improvement, where we map out the current process, do activity-based costing, identify what the potential benefit, what the defects are, design the new process, and then prepare a business case for change. And we looked at the, using uh, that with our old techniques completely manually versus supported with Sirocco, we saw there's 26% less, less effort. I thought that was an interesting tidbit to throw in. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, um, it's not always necessarily the effort, I think. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to accelerate. It's not always the effort reduction of, of defining these processes. It's the effort reduction that can be done in the, in the downstream processes because they are perpetual benefits back to the business, you know, hours back to the business or reduction of effort. But, you know, anything that gets you, you know, with, with partners like T-Impact, you know, they can get you to an end goal of understanding where you've got the biggest opportunity to transform. For us, that that's our... You know, that's our every waking moment we spend with our customers and our partners. So, yeah, thank you for that, bit, um, Keith. Great, thank you. Um, and we have, we've got one more question before we move on to um, uh, the demo. Um, so, uh, Chris, this this is for you again, and you may have already answered part of it, but um, somebody's asking, what's the difference between task mining and process mining? And how does it support building an automation pipeline? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I did sort of allude to that in the previous statement but yeah. i think you know process mining is a really powerful tool for kind of gaining in, insight into enterprise level you know processes whereas you know task mining and what we do operates at a desktop level to discover and analyze you know tasks that users perform 
you know, in between the, the interactions they have with those enterprise applications. We actually coexist really well with some of the kind of market leading process mining tools because when combined, looking at it from both uh, uh, levels, it's really that effort that's often expended um, in between processes that's that's probably the most critical factor that adds to the time it takes to get a task complete. Now, I'll give you an example just very briefly to, to put some context to it. Um, you know, if you were, you know, uh, working in finance and, and, and following a, a process for, you know, vendor invoice management or procure to pay, you know, if you were using a process mining technology, what you would see is the entry and, and, and sort of the flow of that across the business applications that produce logs. And, and realistically, we believe that's between 20 and 30 percent of the overall process. But when deploying task mining um, in a secure and, 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 uh, and quick fashion, what you can actually see is all of the interactions that those end users take to get that process complete, which can include using tools like Microsoft Office Suite, including Outlook, that typically don't produce logs that can be analyzed, that might include punching out to collaboration tools and communication tools to, to kind of identify information that's critical to complete that process. But also, you know, our system can interact with legacy green screen applications um, and also kind of special applications that have been configured to, to just capture small aspects of that process. So we're able to paint that really clear and critical step-by-step, click-by-click map of exactly how that task is undertaken. Prior to, you know, prior to automation, we can help with cleanup, but fundamentally, and this is really where I think we've seen the biggest acceleration as a business, we can use that really deep level five detail of the clicks and the actions that take place to help build RPA. And so you know, we have built, built in out of the box integrations to the likes of UiPath, Blue Prism and other, other such RPA tools that will help you build between 50 and 80% of those RPAs um, you know, straight out of the box. So, you know, I think that hopefully answers where task mining helps capture the detail that's often important for transformation and, and where process mining is also a valuable tool to look at that from a system architecture perspective. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Chris. So Keith, I'll hand over to you briefly before we... Uh play the demo. Brilliant. <clears throat> so our, our demonstration came off the back of a uh, participation in a digital fair for Hounslow. And the scenario they wanted for us to do is to come up with a way that you could use intelligent automation to demonstrate how you could uh, assist the mentally ill. So this building off one of their own scenarios, we identified this uh, poor chap, Brendan, who's got early stage dementia. Um, the council's come up with some really clever ideas his daughter wants to uh, help him remain in his flat. Um, so she notices his, his uh, post is going to the wrong address and she wants to get the address changed so she can redirect it. She signs into a website, accesses a new digital service to change the address, and she's given a pin to uh, confirm her authority as Brendan's guardian. So when we look at this process, there's three key milestones. We're determining and authorizing the service. We're provi providing the service and then we're confirming that the service has been delivered. And the reason it's important to confirm the service is because many people, such as myself, call up a call center, they're told that something's done, but they know that quite often the call center agent gets distracted and doesn't do that. So they'll call back a few hours later or the next day to just check that it's done. All that extra waste of your call center agents answering the phones and saying, yes, the last guy did their job is what's defined as waste. So in determining and authorizing the service, the customer is going to request a just change. The chatbot is going to determine what's required the, and request a PIN. The customer is going to enter the PIN. And then the chatbot instructs the robot to please go away and validate the PIN. And once it's validated, we go into provide service. That's the chatbot will then ask the customer to enter a postcode and they'll then send the postcode to the robot and ask the robot to look up the valid addresses. Um, and then those valid addresses are presented by the chatbot that allows the customer to select. And uh, once the customer selects, we are gonna, for compliance reasons, just get an absolute verification that that is what the change that they want to perform. So we've got that on record. And then the, the chatbot's gonna turn the robot loose. 
the robot's going to go and access Northgate housing system and Liquid Logic social care system. It's going to update the address in both of those. It's going to do it consistently. It's going to do it without making any typographical errors, and it's not going to do one and forget to do the other. And then we'll, once that's complete, the robot will come back and let the chatbot know, and the chatbot will move on in the customer journey and ask the customer, would you like us to confirm this? If so, please give us an email address. Once we have the email address, it'll send the email through to the customer. The customer will have the evidence that the work's actually been done. So hopefully the customer will call back to confirm. So Karen, I'll hand over to you now to uh, run, the, run the video since the lab demo is acting up on us. <laughs> Okay, no, bear uh, with me I'll one chat moment. Okay. On the left side of the screen, you see a mobile phone emulator, that black box with the four icons at the top. Um, so that what you're seeing on the screen is what Marco would have been typing onto his mobile phone uh, if we were doing a live demo. In the top right, you've got a uh, a window showing uh, 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 accessing the uh, cloud infrastructure where the robot orchestrator and bots are running. Okay, I'm going to press play now. Is it playing, Karen? Uh, it is playing. Can you not hear that? Oh, there we go. So you can see the mobile phone emulator has pulled up a, a, a web browser, Google, selecting a link there to the TMPACT website. Uh, that link goes directly to a, a web page where the demo is running. And the demo kicks off. Um, we have a selection of languages here, English or Spanish, but in this example, we're just going to choose English. Just let it run, Karen. Don't uh, don't pause when I speak. So obviously this is a recording rather than the live demo and uh, Mark was chatting quite a bit at this point with some delays. So uh, you see now Marco has been, uh, is typing into the conversation line uh, instructions of what he would like to do. He's doing it in just a natural language. He's not having to select a specific thing. And, and the, the chat bot is interpreting what he says and understanding what he needs to, what it actually needs to do. And so it's understood that it wants a change of address and it's for someone else. So therefore we need to get verification that you have access. So now that the PIN number has been entered, you see on the right hand side, some green buttons with some words next to them. That's the window into the cloud infrastructure I talked about. Um, that's where our robot is being kicked off and has actually gone and looked up the PIN code from the access control, returned back and said, nope, sorry, that's not correct. So it's just chatting away in a very uh, natural human language type. That's not correct. Do you have your pen device uh, in, a, in a very non-threatening conversational manner? So we've now entered the pen number 5441, and you'll see the, uh, the green boxes shift up on the right-hand side, which means that the robot is run again. It's verified the postcode, uh, sorry, the, the pen number and told the chatbot it can proceed. The chatbots ask for a postcode. It's now sent the postcode to the robot and the robot is sent back a list of uh, addresses, which you can just skim through there. 
So regardless of the size of your window, whether you're on a laptop or a mobile, you're not limited to the width of the screen. You can scroll right and left. And here we're confirming it. Again, this is for compliance reasons. We want a, a, a record definitively stating, yes, these are the changes I want to make to these records. As GDPR gets more and more important, uh, more and more prevalent, uh, it's more increasingly important to get this compliance captured. So the robot's now gone into Liquid Logic. For those of you who aren't familiar with Liquid Logic, it's a social care system uh, used by many local councils. It's searching in the social care system to find a match. And now it's found Brendan's record. It's going to pull that up and change the address. So the robot's completed updating Liquid Logic. It's now opening up uh, the Northgate housing system because we know in this case that Brendan's uh, information is in two different systems for the council. It could be in five or 10 different systems. And this is one of the most common problems that councils face is that they don't have a central customer reg register and the customer data is scattered over any number of IT systems. And when a customer comes in to change their address at some point in their life, some of the systems get changed and others don't. And it makes it very, very difficult to uh, derive any real intelligence out of the data in your systems because you can't match them up. So uh, again, it's searched for uh, Brendan, found Brendan, updating the address on Northgate. So as opposed to a customer filling in a Adobe PDF form or filling in a uh, writing a letter and sending in or writing an email, this is work that's being done in real time. While the customer waits on the phone, the address is actually being changed. So we can offer the customer, would you like some evidence that this has been changed? Um, so uh, Brendan's daughter in this case, Miss Smith, has entered her email address. And what the robot's going to do is go away and collect that evidence and email it to her to hopefully avoid any re repeat calls. So the chatbot has instructed the robot. The robot's uh, using the email address to prepare the email. And it's now finished that and told the, the uh, Ms. Smith, thank you very much. We've completed all of our activities and that's the end of the uh, customer journey. Um, but we just wanted to show you the evidence that, that uh, what, what the customer would actually receive in this instance. Um, so there's the email address, uh, the email uh, sent through to Ms. Smith and uh, in the video it's just opening up and it's gonna actually show her the screen print to demonstrate that the address has been changed. Obviously, this could be any form of evidence you want to provide. We just thought it was quite interesting that we could send the, the actual screen prints through, and we've done that for both of the systems. So, Karen, that concludes the demo. Were there any other uh, questions? Uh, no, no, that's all we have. Um, that's all we have today. Thank you very much. We've come to the end. It's five o'clock. Thank you very much for everybody that that joined and um, we'll be sending a recording of, of this webinar out to you tomorrow and it'll also be available on our website thank you very much thanks everyone bye-bye thanks guys thank you